I'm just going to introduce our speaker for today. So first of all, welcome everybody. This is the second of this autumn's QI seminar, and it's the first seminar on an experimental topic. And today's speaker is David Iberson. David is a PhD student at the Center for Doctoral Training in Quantum Engineering at the University of Bristol. But for the last three years, he's been located at the Hitachi Cambridge Laboratory, where he's been working on implementing quantum electronics. So, so with that, I'm just uh, handing over the virtual floor to you, David, um, and, and thanks for, for coming here. Yeah, nice. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, so yeah, I'm um, going to be talking today to you about um, an experiment we did last autumn um, with our really nice um, nanowire field effect transistors and a superconducting resonator, uh, which we managed to um, sort of push towards the circuit QED regime. So we saw this, uh, what we're calling a large dispersive interaction between microwave photons in our spiral resonator pictured here and the um, field effect transistor charge qubit on the right. Okay. So uh, first I'm going to introduce the two level system, um, the double quantum dot that is formed in our um, nanowire device that's produced in a CMOS foundry. So it's, um, it's quite scale, it's scale, it's meant to be scalable. Um, and then I'm, I'll talk about how we incorporate this uh, into a lumped element resonator, the microwave cavity to build a circuit QED experiment and uh, how we observed a charge state dependent frequency shift of the resonator um, and uh, model this with a James Cummings Hamiltonian, pretty straightforward. Um, and then use this model to extract a, a charge photon coupling rate. Um, and then also uh, we observe quite a fast charge decoherence in this model as well. And then finally, um, we do some readout of the charge state um, and demonstrate that what we've built can read out very quickly and it's also compatible with multiplexing. Okay, so um, my PhD is focused on making scalable qubits in CMOS devices, but uh, why is this a good idea? So the main physics reason is that we can achieve long spin coherence times in silicon because it's got a very small spin orbit interaction and it's also naturally free of nuclear spins apart from a little bit of silicon 29, but um, this has been isotopically purified out in some experiments um, and uh, T2s as long as 28 milliseconds have been achieved. So, um, and then on top of this is the strategic advantage that CMOS foundries can already fabricate large arrays of devices with high yield. And if we can make qubits compatible with that, we can scale up to potentially millions of qubits very quickly. And so far, um, two qubit gates have been demonstrated in such devices. Um, with this structure that we see on the left that was fabricated in the university clean room on a metal oxide semiconductor type device. Um, however, this is clearly very complicated and it's not going to scale well if we try and put that in to a, a CMOS foundry. So in our lab, we take the opposite approach where um, we see what we can achieve with devices which have been produced in an industrial clean room like this one on the right. So this is the device that we're using. It's a nanowire transistor uh, fabricated at CEA Letty, the boundary in Grenoble, as part of the Mosquito EU project. So what they do is they etch a 70 nanometer wide nanowire from a silicon non insulator substrate, and they oxidize this exposed um, surface, these three exposed surfaces of the nanowire thermally um, with a six nanometer oxide and then they fabricate the conductive polysilicon gate on top of that. That wraps around the three sides of the nanowire. Uh, so this structure, they found, this structure is very important. They found it creates um, two tightly confined electrostatic quantum dots in these top corners that I've highlighted in yellow here. And these 
um, these electrostatic quantum dots have a very large capacitive coupling to the gate, which means we can have great control of the electric potential of those. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to independently control these two quantum dots. So they use um, a final gate fabrication E-beam, electron beam lithography step to split that gate in half um, at the center of the nano wires to do that independent gate control. And then finally, uh, to they have to implant the n-type dopants into the source and drain contacts for our transistor. Um, and during this step, the, the gate protects the nano wire so we don't get any dopants close to the quantum dots. Okay, so just to quickly explain how these electrostatically defined quantum dots work, let's start with a single quantum dot um, in what's called a single electron transistor. So we can see in this top graph that as the voltage on the gate is increased, we get spikes in the conductivity between the source and drain reservoirs. And this is periodic with the charging energy of the quantum dot. So the charging energy is the energy needed to overcome the Coulomb repulsion and add another electron to the quantum dot. And that's, so that's related to the sum of the capacitances between the quantum dot and the gate and the source and the drain, et cetera. So these spikes occur at transitions between the stable, they, they occur at transitions between the stable charge states where we get tunneling in, in and out of the quantum dot where that's blocked in those, in those stable charge states. Um, and to be able to form the quantum dot, we must have the um, non-conducting regions separating it from the source and drain. Um, and these must have a resistance greater than the resistance quantum or H over E squared. Um, and also to prevent thermal excitation across these, these barriers, the, the phonon energy must be smaller than the charging energy. So this means that the semiconductor quantum dots typically operate um, in, in dilution refrigerators at millikelvin temperatures. So then if we go to a system with a double quantum dot with one independent, with one gate to control each, to, uh, so two independent gates, um, we can observe these, these 2D plots where these lines are um, the, the, the spikes in the conductivity. Um, so the, the, the vertical transitions are, vertical lines are transitions of the dot that's underneath gate one, and the horizontal lines are charge transitions of the quantum dot that's underneath the gate two. So this case on the left is where there's no mutual capacitance between the quantum dots. Um, but when there is a mutual capacitance, we get this case on the right um, where it opens up these transitions with a positive gradient. And this corresponds to transfer of electrons between the dots as opposed to charge transfer with the source and drain reservoirs. So it's, it's these interdot inter transitions that we're most interested in um, because when we're using the spin of the electrons, um, exchange, exchanging a, a spin with the reservoirs leaves us in an unpredictable state whereas the interdot transitions allow us to perform a quantum non-demolition type readout in the singlet triplet basis. So that's more interesting. Uh, but for the rest of this talk, we're not gonna do any spin physics. All this data I'm going to show is with the magnet switched off. Okay. So to model these interdot charge transitions, uh, we use a typical two level model where the, the two states are the excess electron occupying the left or the right quantum dot indicated by these um, popular dot, quantum dot electron population numbers N1 and N2. Um, so then this epsilon parameter, the detuning, is, um, is the detuning of the potentials between um, 
the potentials of the two charge states uh, indicated by these diagrams on the left and the right. So uh, at zero detuning, these potentials are degenerate and at positive detuning or negative detuning, um, these, these favor either one or the other of the charge states. And clearly when we vary the detuning, um, how we vary the detuning is by changing the voltages we apply to those two gates. And the minimum transition energy at zero detuning is what we call the tunnel coupling by this indicated by TC. And omega Q is the, um, the transition energy as a function of the detuning. So is the experiment that we put together in the Hitachi lab to perform our circuit QED experiment and the dispersive readout. So we put the, the double quantum dot um, into a microwave cavity by, by wire bonding one of the gates to this, this superconducting spiral shown up here. Um, and by doing this, we end up with a lump element LC type resonator where the, the CMOS device is effectively a capacitor and the spiral is the inductor. Um, the, we get a characteristic impedance of about 560 ohms. Um, we'll come back to that in a slide or two. Um, and we also need to apply a DC bias to the top gate, um, which we, so we've included this, this bias T shown down here, connected to the opposite end of the spiral. Um, and also the, the microwave signal is delivered to the spiral via this um, microstrip waveguide on the superconducting chip here, um, which is fabricated so close to the spiral that um, the microwaves couple in um, to the spiral via the mutual inductance between the two. Um, so we fabricated this superconducting chip um, from an 80 nanometer niobium nitride film on sapphire that, uh, that was deposited in the materials department. And we patented that in our clean room in microelectronics with optical lithography. And just, uh, so we achieved a, a width and a spacing of these um, spiral turns down to four microns with that technique. So we use the, the James Cummings Hamiltonian to describe the, the charge photon coupling, where um, <clears throat> we've got the, uh, the charge state two level system here, uh, described by the omega Q transition frequency. And this is the, the, the resonant frequency of our cavity. These are the cavity photon states. And this third term is the, the coupling between the two described by this um, coherent coupling rate G. So, um, but when the, in the dispersive regime, which is defined as using this condition here, that the, the, the tuning between the qubit and the cavity is greater than the coherent coupling G, uh, in this case, the, the hybridization of the qubit and the cavity states mean that um, the state of the qubit can actually be inferred by probing the cavity because we get this, um, <clears throat> if we rearrange the terms, we get this frequency shift of the cavity, which depends on sigma z, the, the state of the qubit. <clears throat> and that's indicated by this um, diagram over here. We get this state dependent frequency shift um, and by probing the cavity to find this frequency shift this is what we call dispersive readout so one of the aims of our experiment was to improve the fidelity and the speed of this dispersive readout technique um, and we can see here that the way to do that is by maximizing this coupling strength g so uh, we can relate G, the coupling strength, in terms of engineering parameters um, like this. 
So because the quantum dots are capacitively coupled to the two top gates, um, <clears throat> we're talking about um, the coupling of the voltage in those two top gates to the charge of the single electrons. And given this coupling mechanism, we come up with a, an equation like this. So um, firstly, this parameter, there's this parameter called the lever arm, um, which is a value between zero and one that relates the, the gate voltage to the electric potential energy of the double quantum dot. And that's fixed by device geometry. Uh, the geometry of our, our nanowire FET. Um, and as I briefly touched upon before, the, the cross section, um, the nanowire cross section that we have gives us a nice high alpha in comparison to planar transistors. Um, and just a, another point on this that we'll come back to later is uh, we found in these devices a fabrication defect. So I don't know if you can tell here but there's a slight offset between the, the center of this gap and the center of the nanowire. So one of the gates covers one of the quantum dots more than the other. And we'll see that this has, uh, this gives an increased um, lever arm for the interdot charge transitions um, that we're interested in. So this was, this enables us to perform even faster readout. Um, and the other parameters that are beneficial for the, uh, the coupling strength, uh, we've got the impedance, and now that gives the that gives the ratio of the voltage to current in the um, in the amplitude of the oscillations in the in the resonator. So therefore, we want to maximise the impedance, and uh, we also see the resonant frequency is in there. Now this makes sense because in order to increase the resonant frequency, we have to decrease the volume um, and therefore the, the electric fields are, are stronger because they're confined to a smaller volume. So both of those things maximize the voltage amplitude in the resonator. Okay, so this is the, um, the, the resonant the, uh, the resonant frequency of our, um, our coupled spiral and nanowire FET system. So it resonates at about 1.88 gigahertz. And it's, um, we get a Q factor, a loader Q of 612 or an internal Q of about 1500. So it's not, not massively high uh, because this is two separate chips that are wire bonded together. You, um, you'll see that fully integrated systems that have been fabricated in universities can get higher internal quality factors. Um, so that, and this translates to a, a cavity loss rate of three megahertz. And uh, this, this asymmetric um, resonance is an interesting point that's modeled by a complex external quality factor and that captures uh, some interference between the microwaves coupling in and out of the spiral from the cavity, uh, in and out of the spiral from the waveguide. So this is the uh, phase response we see in the cavity as the two gate voltages are varied, um, showing those nice charge transitions and we see uh, this this double quantum dot has a lot of very nice interdot charge transitions um, at the um, at the crossings between these vertical and horizontal lines. Um, and there are a few things we can learn briefly about our, our device by inspecting this. Um, firstly, the the T1 transitions, the vertical transitions, are much clearer than the, the B1 transitions. Um, and this is because we've connected, we've wire bonded our resonator to the T1 gate. So this is a good sanity check that um, we, we're seeing the response from the appropriate quantum dot. Um, and another thing 
you might see that the x and the y axes are not equal um, because the, the B1 transitions are much more spread out than the T1 transitions. And so this is, this is evidence of the misalignment in the, um, in the gap in the gates that we were talking about. So the, the B1 gate has a much smaller overlap with the B1 quantum dot than the T1 gate has with the T1 quantum dot. Um, and thirdly, um, we see that the, the interdot transitions are, they're very, they're quite small and there's, there's very little signal to be seen um, in those. So that implies there's quite a small tunnel coupling between the quantum dots when there's, when there's only a few electrons in each quantum dot. Um, so to observe a, a good, um, a large coupling between the quantum dots that we can and so that we can observe tunneling between the quantum dots in an appropriate time scale compared to the, the probe frequency. Um, we're going to have to go to higher electron numbers um, to be able to observe a, a significant signal. Okay, so we're going to look at this transition here between the, um, the configuration with 7 and 11 to the configuration with 8 and 10. So this is the, uh, the zoomed in picture of that interdot charge transition. And when we analyze the, the frequency spectrum, as we sweep the gate voltages across this transition, um, we see this nice big shift in the frequency, um, which is that dispersive shift we were talking about earlier. And when we, so from our model, um, if, we, if we plug in the values for strong coupling in the dispersive regime, we get something that looks quite similar to this. Um, but we get a nice large frequency shift that's, um, I think it's about four megahertz. Um, but interestingly, in the, in the data, we see that the, um, the resonance becomes very broad at zero detuning. And that this is why we see um, a fade out of this, this um, cavity, this, um, at this depth in S11 here. Whereas in the, um, in the model, it pretty much stays, the resonance stays um, nice and sharp and nice and thin. So this is showing us that the, the relaxation rate of our cavity is very fast. Um, so this is the this is the model that we use to um, produce that uh, simulation that I just showed in the last slide. So this is um, following an example from this PRB paper here. Um, so we see the um, This is our frequency shift here, the, the chi, which is related to um, the, the detuning and also the, the charge decoherence rate. So gamma is the charge decoherence rate. The, we've got the tunnel coupling is included as well. Um, and the, the qubit frequency is a function of voltage detuning given by this omega q here. Um, and kappa is the, the loss rate of our cavity, kappa external is the external loss rate of the cavity related to the external quality factor. Um, and then delta R and delta Q are the detunings of the resonator 
and the qubit with respect to the, the drive frequency omega. Okay, so here we um, change the, the values we put into the model to try and reproduce our data. So um, the resonator line width and the frequency we already knew from before, um, 1.8 gigahertz and three megahertz. Um, so what we do is we chain, we've um, fitted the, the coherent coupling rate G, the tunnel coupling and the cavity loss rate to produce this nice model, which is in good agreement with the data we see. And so we get a, a nice large coherent coupling rate of 183 megahertz. Um, our tunnel coupling is eight, about eight gigahertz, which crucially is um, much larger than the, um, this, this, this means that the detuning between the um, tunnel coupling and the cavity frequency is much larger than the coherent coupling rate G. So we're in the dispersive regime. And finally, we see that this um, qubit loss rate is very high, six, six gigahertz. So um, if, if we were in the strong coupling regime, um, G would be greater than the loss rate of the cavity and the loss rate of the qubit. But we're not in that regime. We're in um, the regime where the qubit is the qubit loss is higher than the coupling between the qubit and the cavity. And if we use our equation from before for the coherent coupling strength G, uh, we predict we can predict a similar um, coupling strength about 140 megahertz using the value for our lever arm, the frequency and the, uh, the impedance of our cavity from before. If we can compare this with um, some other similar experiments, um, we see that this um, coupling strength is good. It's, it's comparable with um, these systems that did actually achieve strong coupling. Um, and we've also got a similar cavity loss rate, but our qubit loss rate is much worse. Um, so this is something that we need to look at if we want to try and achieve strong coupling in this system. Um, so thinking about what could cause this fast charge relaxation, firstly, um, we've got enhancement due to the um, due to the density of states in the cavity, uh, also known as the Purcell effect. So um, when we calculate this, uh, this this should be about two point five kilohertz. So um, we're pretty confident that this is not what we're seeing. Um, secondly, it could be measurement induced decoherence. Uh, again, this is orders of magnitude smaller than what we're seeing. So we conclude that it's likely charge noise at the, um, the interface, um, which, which can be expected in the silicon, silicon dioxide interface. Um, and this has previously been observed in, in similar CMOS devices, um, so measured using uh, landau zener interferometry, they also observed a, a relaxation rate of about four gigahertz. So um, this is evidence that this is something that needs to be improved. Okay, so then we looked at a different charge trend, uh, interdot charge transition and so by doing this, we change um, the shape of the quantum dots and therefore we can change the, the tunnel coupling between the two quantum dots. Um, so we, this can put us in a different regime. Um, we can get in the, since we were in the dispersive regime before, we might move to the resonant regime, which is what we see here. Um, 
So we don't have this large dispersive frequency shift anymore. Um, we've got evidence that we're in the regime where we could start to see um, coherent transfer of information between the charged qubit and the photons. Um, in this case, we can fit the model parameters given here. Um, again, we see a fast charge relaxation rate, two gigahertz, um, and the qubit frequency is, as I was saying, we're close to the to the resonant regime now. It's actually lower than the um, the cavity frequency, so we should see sort of two spots either side where it crosses, where the um, the qubit um, frequency crosses the cavity frequency. Um, and finally, we see the uh, coherent coupling rate uh, has dropped to 30 megahertz. And that is something that um, they see in the superconducting qubit community as well, that the, um, <clears throat> the coherent coupling rate can be affected by the, the characteristic frequency of the qubit, which is in our case, the, um, the tunnel coupling. Okay, so finally, uh, we go back to the other charge transition, which gave us the large frequency shift and characterize the, the readout um, performance. So uh, here we can see, here what we did was we switched uh, using a square wave between um, a region which is off the ICT and on the ICT signal, um, produce a square wave trace like this. And in the IQ plane, we get two uh, blobs which are separated by this parameter A and B is the, um, the, the uncertainty, the, the radius of those blobs. Uh, and so we repeat this with different integration times to find the minimum integration time, uh, which corresponds to a SNR of one. Uh, and we find this minimum integration time is about 10 nanoseconds, which is um, shorter than has been achieved before with dispersive readout in semiconductor um, systems. So just to compare uh, with a fully integrated resonator, 100 nan 160 nanoseconds was, was achieved and um, using a, a Josephson parametric amplifier uh, 18, down to 80 nanoseconds was achieved. So um, our, our superconducting spirals that with the inductive coupling to the, the resonate, the, um, the waveguide is a very good readout system for reading out these uh, CMOS charge qubits. <clears throat> and here is a trace at, with an integration time of 50 nanoseconds, we can see We've got an SNR of 3.3. And just finally, um, this you can you can see how this system could be uh, scaled up to do frequency multiplexing of the readout. Since we've got uh, a waveguide with placing spirals next to it, we could just change the geometry of those spirals to achieve different resonant frequencies. And then we've got multiple cavities all coupled to one microwave line. Um, so we, uh, we demonstrated this um, with two different single gate devices. Um, so these are, these diagrams are showing charge transitions in these single gate devices. And these, um, these plots were obtained simultaneously. So we used this, um, this room temperature RF setup shown here um, where we've got two um, input signals <clears throat> operating at 1.8 and 2.4 gigahertz. Um, and these are combined to send down the waveguide and then the reflected signal is split and demodulated with the two frequencies. Uh, we also quickly characterized the, the crosstalk in this system to make sure that um, the wrong frequency wasn't getting to the the each so each device was only receiving one fre frequency the resonant frequency of that resonator and we can see that 
Um, so we did this by looking at the power of the, the mixed signal. And we could only see as, um, any mixed signal above the noise when we increased the power to levels much higher than we normally use. These um, can be a bit damaging for the device. Um, so, and there was no, um, crucially, there was no um, dependence of this on the voltages of the devices. So this indicates that this mixing was occurring in the room temperature RF equipment and not uh, in our resonance system at low temperature. So to summarize, uh, we've satisfied one requirement for strong photon charge coupling, um, <clears throat> which is that the, the coupling rate is larger than the photon loss rate. And this has not been done in, with CMOS devices before. And unfortunately, uh, we've seen a large charge dephasing rate. That means the second requirement for strong coupling is not likely to be achieved um, to the charge state. Um, so we might have to look at the, um, coupling to the spin, which is what they've done in silicon germanium devices. Um, <clears throat> and finally, we've uh, performed fast state readout in 50 nanoseconds with an SNR of three, um, which corresponds to uh, a predicted fidelity of 99.7% if we used an integration time of 300 nanoseconds. So as I mentioned, um, if we want to achieve strong coupling in CMOS devices, um, we'd have to couple to the spin state of an electron um, by possibly by introducing an artificial spin orbit coupling as they've done with micromagnets in other systems or we could couple to the spin state of a hole uh, instead of an electron since holes have a larger spin orbit coupling in silicon and finally um, we'd like to test our cavity with other semiconductor qubits um, and see how characterize the readout performance with those. So I'd just like to thank everyone um, who's been helping with this work um, in Itachi, Fernando, and Lisa, and James, uh, and the, um, the in the materials department, Jason Robinson's group from um, fabricating the Nibium films, and uh, the other PhD students who've been helping with some of the um, experiment taking. Um, and the University of Bristol and the EPFLC for funding the MyCDT in quantum engineering, and finally the, the group in Grenoble who fabricated the CMOS devices. And there's a report on archive if you'd like to read more about it. And um, just finally, um, this paper here, which has been performed in similar devices, is going to be talked about on the 27th of November by Theo Lundberg. Thanks everyone. Does so anybody have if we've got any questions? I'd be happy to hear. Yeah, thank you very much, David. This was a super interesting talk. Thanks. Uh, as I said in the beginning, if, if anyone has uh, questions they'd like to ask, you, you can just drop them in the QA section, which you find by hovering over your screen and, and at the bottom of it. Um, but, but whilst people, people drop questions in there, I, I thought I, yeah. I had one or two questions that I'd, I'd like to ask. So maybe if you could go back to the, to the slide where you showed um, the, the, um, the figure that had the, um, the um, conduction lines between different electron numbers on the dots. Yeah. Uh, yes, for example, yeah. And I mean, I, I, I'm coming from this from a very theoretical perspective, but I noticed that like things kind of stop at, at, at uh, four or five electrons. And like, mm. um, what, what's kind of, what's the experimental barrier in your system for going down to fewer, fewer electrons in these dots? So the, the signal is affected by 
the um, the coupling of the um, the quantum dot to the source and drain. Uh, so in the in the case of these these vertical and horizontal lines, these mm -hmm. are transitions from the quantum dot to the source or the drain. Um, so when we see a signal, that is because um, an electron is is tunneling to the quantum dot on the source of drain. And this is occurring in a similar time scale to the frequency at which we're probing the system, so 1.8 gigahertz. Um, so we to to be able to see these transitions, we need faster tunnel rates um, in the in the few electron regime. Um, or we or it's been shown in other uh, readout techniques, for example, using uh, a single electron transistor charge sensor with very similar devices. Um, a recent paper from UNSW, they, uh, they went all the way down to the single electron regime and they can see signal. Right. Okay. Thanks. I think we've just got the question from Alex Lasek. Uh, Alex, I've made you a, a panelist, so you should be able to unmute yourself. And right. Yeah. I, can you see the question? Because I think it disappeared for me. When I, I think it's better that you just re-ask the question live. Right. Yeah. So if, if you're going to use your uh, double quantum dot as a qubit, do you have an idea how you could define the logical zero and one states of the qubit? Would it be the transition on the red square that you focus on here? Yeah, so, so this, this transition here is basic, I mean, it's not ideal. Um, it's basically trying to, uh, as I mentioned, we want to use the spin state uh, to define the qubit because the spin has a long lived um, relaxation time in silicon. Um, so what, um, and what we want to do as well is we want to do a, a quantum non-demolition readout. So that means um, transferring, that means having two quantum dots trying to transfer one electron between the quantum dots in, in a single triplet qubit basis. So this is the, this is the qubit basis we have in our head. Um, but this charge transition here um, with many electrons in the system is not ideal. I mean, we want to have as few degrees of freedom in the system as possible. Um, but this is, uh, this is an even parity transition, which, mean, which means that um, the electron that's being transferred is pairing up with an electron in, in the quantum dot that it's being transferred to. So this mimics the, the single triplet readout that we would like to perform. Mm -hmm. uh, and also wanted to ask if you have an idea of how you could do uh, qubit rotations if this was to be used like in a quantum computer in the future. Yeah, so there's, there's, uh, there's quite a few ways that have been um, looked at for this so far. Um, so one option is, as I mentioned, um, they put micromagnets on top of the um, on top of the silicon substrate, and to induce um, a, a non-linear, I think it is magnetic field, so that when you apply um, an oscillating electric field, you're wiggling the electron in the non-linear magnetic field, and that's um, generating an oscillating magnetic field to give you um, ESR electron spin resonance. Um, so that's one option, but I don't personally like that option because the point of silicon is that you have a low spin orbit coupling and what you're doing there is you're introducing an artificial permanent spin orbit coupling. So you're going to have shorter coherence and relaxation times. Um, so another option uh, in these devices is using the spin orbit, spin orbit coupling of holes. Um, or what's also been done is using a, um, a microwave antenna, which when you fire a, a high current through it, generates an oscillating magnetic field for ESR again. 
So there's a few different ways. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And possibly a two qubit gate in the future, like how to couple two qubits. Um, yeah, so two qubit gates. Um, they, so you can use the exchange interaction between the two spins. Um, and one method of doing that, I think, is to have an a exchange gate in the middle of the two, uh, what they're called plunger gates that control the quantum dots. And you use this exchange gate to modulate the strength of the exchange interaction um, by changing the coupling between the quantum dots. Um, but yeah, there's a few different ways depending on how you choose to define your qubit and it's not clear in the community which is the best way to do that yet. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I think we now have a question from first from Thierry Ferris and then from Theodore Lundberg. Thierry, I've made you a panelist, so if you could just Thanks. repeat your question, please. Hey, Thierry. Yeah. Um, hi, David. Uh, nice beer, by the way. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Uh, very good talk. I really enjoy it. Um, I think I'm, um, I already probably asked you um, uh, some time ago those kind of questions, but maybe I, I should rephrase it for today. Um, so you talk about the uh, qubit loss, and most, I mean, most of the talk was about um, looking at the region between uh, around seven, eight, uh, for the electron number. Yeah. Uh, some numbers. Um, and then you move, I think, around five uh, for, and you get another, um, a different regime in that case. So my question was, is there any correlation across that graph, for example, if you test like um, eight, uh, electron number eight, uh, or five, six, four, or I don't know how far you can go down and try to see how the loss evolves, is there some logic or it's totally random? And the, the idea a bit that, behind that, I mean, uh, because obviously, as you mentioned it, uh, the charge noise is quite a big issue. And by varying the number of electrons, you will somehow modify that. You may have some screen, you may have different interaction. And so maybe you can get an idea of what's going on there. I don't know, it's just an idea. So my question is, did you see any, some correlation across the graph? Yeah, I mean, we've not looked at the um, loss rate of many different ICTs. Um, not no sort of systematic study or of that kind that you're talking about. Um, but yeah, I, I agree this, um, this might help shed, help us shed some light on it. Um, it because yeah, it, it varies a lot with the shape of the quantum dot and the, the number of electrons that are in there and having a lot of electrons in there um, leaves you in possibly an unpredictable um, configuration of the, of the filling of the uh, orbitals and the valleys that you have in, in the quantum dot. Um, so yeah, this, I think this is probably what is needed next to investigate that. Right. Okay, thanks. thanks. Okay. Hi, David. I... Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Hey, Theo. Um, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, this is just a, more of a formality question, I guess, uh, based on the community and what your sense is. So the, the readout uh, quote that you state in terms of fidelity and SNR and minimum integration time, um, you never said spin readout, and I guess that's because you never actually distinguish between the spin states, right? Um, even though the exact measurement mimics how you would do a spin readout. Um, is that just just purely because you didn't dis distinguish between spin states that you avoid saying spin readout or? Yeah. Um, so yeah, in, uh, in theory, we, we, if, if we had a, a good, um, a good system of of long-lived spin qubit states, 
we could distinguish between them um, with that fidelity that I gave 99.7 in an integration time of 300 nanoseconds. Um, but in this system, because we are in an, a regime with so many electrons, we didn't see um, a nice um, we didn't see a nice long lived spin system. So we couldn't do the spin readout and it would have um, it might have been nice to see do the full demonstration of spin readout. But um, for all intents and purposes, this charge transition mimics it quite well. Um, I guess one problem with um, that I've not touched on yet with um, doing this at a finite magnetic field is that this can um, change the properties of the niobium nitride film a little bit um, because due to the way that magnetic fields interact with semiconductors. Um, so this is one, one thing to make sure definitely that our, um, our resonator can still perform that well at finite magnetic fields. And we, I mean, we saw a, I don't know how to exit this now. Um, we did see a, a, a frequency shift in our cavity that was um, dependent on the magnetic field. Um, so yeah, it, it can potentially affect the readout fidelity, but not significant, not too much, hopefully. Thanks. So thanks a lot for these questions, guys, and for the answers, David. Do we have any any more questions? I think we have time for maybe one or two. I, I had like a small question on, on this slide here. So yeah. Uh, we've seen you, you've like interpolated from your green experimental dots, I guess, down to the 10 nanoseconds. W what's the kind of experimental limitation in this type of setup for, you? maybe you mentioned this in the talk and I apologize if you did, but like, what's the, what is it you need to add to actually do that on your device? Um, to perform the 10 nanosecond yeah. readout. Um, so in this case, um, we so the, the red lines were using a an amplifier with a minimum, sorry, a, a, a maximum a cut off, a bandwidth cutoff of uh, one megahertz. So we could only get down. This is why this line only goes down to uh, one microsecond integration time. Um, this green line. We measured that using uh, a slightly worse amplifier. That's why the line goes down. Um, but that had a higher cutoff of um, 20 megahertz, I think, or 200 megahertz. Um, so to get down further, we need to have uh, a faster amplifier, basically. OK. And, and are there amplifiers available that, that, that would allow you to, to reach these 10 nanoseconds if you, if you got your hands on the best one out there? Uh, I think so. Um, so this is, this is um, the same. I guess the state of the art in this is probably in the superconducting community. This is exactly the same type of readout that they do with superconducting units. Right. Um, and they have... Yeah, I mean, we've seen the, the kinds of things, feats that they can pull off with their readout systems. So um, it, it should be out there somewhere. Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much for, for this talk. It's been really interesting. I, I, I should mention uh, that this group, so the, the Cavendish QI group has a lot of experience in like simulating single and two qubit operations in, in real experimental devices. So if, if at some point you're, you're, you're doing the transition into qubit operations in these structures, then I, I'm sure many members of our group would be super interested in, in collaborating. Yeah. And we hope to be there one day. <laughs>
Yeah, but it seems like, yeah, it's moving in the right direction, right? So, um, but yeah, thank you very much. Um, so we're, I think we're concluding this, this seminar by this. For, for the group members who wish to, to stay for a 15 minute group chat, please, please hang, hang on to this link. And then for everyone else, thank you very much for, for coming and, and hopefully see you next week.